From Hollywood, it's out of my mind. I'm Jay Douglas, and in Episode 9, we're going from the junkyard to the hitching post, but only after we pay our toll to the troll. It's all part of our mission to bounce around the globe, looking for 17 minutes of essential, non-essential, and curiously essential information that baby boomers need to lead healthy, happy, and productive lives. If you're not a baby boomer, you can still listen to the show, if you're willing to stop spreading the rumor that by working longer, baby boomers are taking away your jobs, even if we are. Whatever works, that's today's motto, as Episode 9 of Out of My Mind begins with a trip to the trash. It is not possible to fully recycle electronics. Kyle Weens is co-founder of iFixit.com, a website dedicated to helping ordinary people fix or repair almost everything in their lives that can break from water heaters to sophisticated electronics. If it sounds as if Kyle is on a quixotic quest to turn around our buy-it, use-it, throw-it-away lifestyle, he is. And for good reason. Out of all the elements on the periodic table, 70 of them are used in modern manufacturing, 50 of those are in your cell phone, 12 of those are recoverable in recycling. The rest is lost in the slag. When they melt things down, it's just lost in the slag heap. We'll never get it back again. We have to dig a big hole in the earth and, and mine new materials all over again. And it's not only a global question about the environment. Replacing rather than repairing has consequences that hit close to home. The more disconnected we are from our products, uh, the worst decisions we're going to make as consumers. Kyle believes that rather than treating broken products as mysterious black boxes, we use them to learn to make better buying decisions. The next time something breaks, take it apart. The, the nice thing about having a broken thing is you're not going to make it any worse, right? It's already broken. Once we start getting inside and we, we're, we start understanding these things, now you can start thinking about whether, as I look at the things that I want to buy, whether it's electronics or otherwise, how repairable is it going to be? How long are these things going to last? The parts, tools, and knowledge we need simply to open up some products, let alone repair them, has faded from society over the last 30 years, ever since the introduction of the VCR. The VCR came along and it was mechanically very complex. If you've ever taken apart the VCR, there's a lot of little bits and gears and fiddly knobs. And it coincided with around the same time the TV manufacturers stopped providing service manuals with TVs. And also, these things were cheaper. And so the kind of the balance of repair is always how much does it cost to repair something? How much time is it to repair it versus just buying a new one? And VCRs were kind of the first mass consumer gadget where all of a sudden it didn't make sense to fix a VCR. 30 years later, that idea has ballooned to the point where we're basing most of our purchasing decisions on price, not quality or longevity. Kyle says it doesn't have to be that way. It is absolutely possible to shift perception. And that's a, a lot of what we're trying to do at iFixit is to re-engineer society a little bit. Every time people do a repair, they're better situated to uh, make um, smarter purchasing decisions. Kyle is enabling change by replacing what was lost after the introduction of the VCR. We make the repair manuals, they're available completely for free. We design really good electronics repair tools. If you want to use those, you can. And we have parts linked in with the repair guides. And, and so if you have an iPhone, you want to, you, you, with a cracked screen, you want to be able to fix it. We've got a step-by-step -step guide, and then we'll sell you a kit with the parts and tools. Kyle says, even if we stop at taking apart that cell phone, television, or toaster for that matter, we'll learn the difference between quality products that will last and cheap products that we'll be buying over and over again. Armed with that information, we have the power to take a few steps backward to the days when quality was an important part of anything we bought. As consumers, we're the ultimate people who dictate what products are made. And if we buy us toward longer lasting products, the manufacturers will follow us. Kyle Weens is co-founder of iFixit.com, where you can find all the resources that you need to repair the products that you buy. I've put a link to the iFixit website in the show notes. You'll also find comments from Kyle on how you can share your knowledge and help others repair rather than replace. Go to bit.ly slash OOMM123. Click on episode 9 and follow the link to show notes. In episode 8, we learned how adopting a pet might be different than the way we did it years ago. In today's episode, we look at another practice that might have changed since our first encounter with it, getting married. My mother planned my wedding. Alicia McCormick hears that all the time. She's host of the Save the Date podcast 
an expert on weddings and wedding planning, and a virtual bridesmaid. Alicia says that for baby boomers, one difference is that mom shouldn't be choosing the wedding theme, or anything else. I think now, if they're getting into their second marriages, it's a time to actually have the wedding they want. The operative word here is they. Although many old-time traditions have fallen by the wayside, one thing that hasn't changed is the challenge of making the planning a two-party affair. Yes, guys, I'm talking to us. A question I'm often asked is, how do you get my fiancé more involved? And I just think you need to be planning an event that you both want to be at, really. But what if she wants a stylish party with mauve napkins, and he wants khaki? As in wearing his khaki shorts. Alicia says that's when it's time to fall back on tradition. A good old pros and cons list. I mean, chuck it out on the table and sort of say, to what advantage does this have? And what disadvantage does this have? I think it's about also compromising to a point of saying, your life is not going to end if you don't have mauve napkins. And actually, mauve napkins aren't that great anyway. So get over, get over it. You know, it's not, people become fixated on small details. And I think when you get to your wedding day, it's not going to matter what color the tablecloths are or how many of your second cousins are there. It's all about celebrating your love and, you know, this commitment you're making to one another. Along with something old, you may have to face something new. Issues that didn't exist when you were first married. For example, if your spouse has passed away, whom do you invite from his or her family? Especially if you have relationships that span three or four decades. One, one piece of advice I was given when we were planning our wedding, and I, I repeat it often because I truly believe it, that I think wedding guests should be a part of your future, not just your past. But does that apply if one of you is divorced? What about inviting that sister of your former spouse, the one who used to hang out at your house all the time, or babysit your kids? No, I think, look, if unless you're very close friends with the sister of your former spouse, or you speak to this person regularly, I think it's just probably unnecessary to invite her unless you're having a 200 head wedding and you're inviting all those sort of people my my gut feeling is in that situation if she's not connected to you and your partner your current partner perhaps not i was kidding earlier about the guy wanting to wear khaki shorts no not really but let's take a question of attire that does pop up in almost all second marriages should the bride wear white not wear white wear something that goes with khaki I just think you can be a lot more loosey-goosey with your choice of clothing and there are heaps of great opportunities to get a lovely, you know, cream suit or a dress from, um, you know, buy it online. You don't have to buy something sparkly and puffy and huge anymore. It's just the times are changing. And to be honest, if you got married in the 70s and 80s, that dress is back in fashion. Alicia McCormick is a wedding expert, virtual bridesmaid, and host of the Save the Date podcast. She is also our first international guest, speaking to us from her home in London. If you're planning a wedding, you'll find more than enough helpful information in her podcasts and on her website to keep you and your future spouse engaged in lively conversation right up till you say I do. I've put links to both in the show notes. Listening to podcasts is nowhere as easy as it should be. There are just too many steps to go through and too much fiddling around. We think it should be as easy to listen to Out of My Mind as it was to listen to music on our transistor or car radios, and we're working on some solutions. Here's the first one. Beginning with episode 10, Out of My Mind shows will be available on YouTube. We took our show, slapped an unchanging picture on it that you're free to ignore, and told YouTube it was a video. Problem solved. It's not the one push-button solution we're looking for, but listening on YouTube is a heck of a lot easier than listening on your computer or podcast app. All you have to do is go to YouTube and search for Out of My Mind Podcast. You'll be able to listen to past and current episodes, leave comments, and subscribe so you're notified when a new show is available. It's everything you probably do now, but with about one-tenth the hassle. So please, beginning with episode 10, give it a try and leave a comment about whether listening on YouTube works for you. Newegg.com is a leading online retailer specializing in computer parts and hardware, hard drives, cameras, software, and other durable goods. Like many online retailers, it's been on the receiving end of demands to pay the toll of the troll. 
it's costing the American economy literally tens of billions of dollars a year. That's Lee Cheng, chief legal officer for Newegg. And he knows all too well the ways of these patent trolls, who are trolls for short. Trolls are companies that own patents and use them not for innovation, but for wringing money out of other companies by exploiting loopholes and inefficiencies in the legal system. Someone can take a patent that is completely useless, that, that has never been made, you know, been, been used to make any sort of commercial product or that has uh, failed miserably in the marketplace, that, you know, it, that has provided no benefit to anyone. They can take this patent and they can easily, easily file a lawsuit against companies making real products and offering real services. And because of some deficiencies in the patent laws and systems, they're able to sustain a lawsuit for a, a very, very long amount of time and make ridiculous demands for damages. And because the burden of and the cost of defending oneself in these lawsuits is so high and because it's so hard to get these lawsuits dismissed, most defendants have to settle. They're forced to settle even though the patents themselves are often completely invalid. They have no merit. Uh, and in most cases, the accused infringer really doesn't infringe anything. But let's back up a second. We're talking about patents. These are issued by the United States government, specifically by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, after careful study. Just because you don't like the fact that a patent covers an invention or process you use doesn't mean you can ignore it. Right? For the most part, these patents, uh, which are essentially government handouts of, of, of property rights, they shouldn't have been given out in the first place. People shouldn't be able to patent something, you know, as, as obvious as a shopping online shopping cart or as a search box or as a drop down menu, right? Things that have had analogs in the real world for like centuries. The problem, Cheng says, starts with an overworked patent office trying to keep up with a flood of new and increasingly complicated applications. It's helped along by a couple of societal misperceptions about patents. The first has to do with who gets them. Even though most are issued to corporations, the myth of the lone inventor still has a strong hold on the American psyche. There's a romantic mythology built around the conception that the idea that patents uh, are, are generated by these brilliant little guys in garages like Thomas Edison and the light bulbs go off in their head and they have these great ideas and when they, when they get a patent, that patent is a reflection, a manifestation of that great idea. Second, there's a basic misperception about what patents represent. There's a belief that the more patents are, are granted, the more innovative a society is, so on and so forth. So there's a heavy, heavy incentive and push, you know, to grant as many patents as possible. Those beliefs translate into a bias toward approving patents. And that means a growing number of grants whose validity has to be challenged in the courts. And that's where the trolls have the upper hand. It still costs almost nothing to obtain a patent, usually less than $10,000 to prosecute an average patent. And it costs far too much to try to invalidate the patent, probably somewhere between two to $300,000. It costs almost nothing to file a lawsuit. And there are no negative consequences for filing a frivolous lawsuit. And it, it costs usually somewhere between one to $6 million to defend oneself against a frivolous lawsuit. You would imagine that if these patents were truly valuable, their owners would target the largest corporate infringers. They're the ones with the deepest pockets. And they're also an easy target because they have reputations for crushing the little guy loan inventor. Cheng says that's not the case. Smaller companies, companies with revenue less than $100 million, they are, are on the receiving end of 80% of these lawsuits. It is a complete lie and myth that you know, patent abusers, patent trolls are defending the little guy. If anything, they are the ones who take advantage of the little guy and they squelch investment in the growth of small and medium-sized businesses and startups more than anything else. With the cost of trial so high, most of these companies accept a troll settlement terms and write a check. So what happens to that money? It doesn't go to generate more innovation. It doesn't go to generate anything that produces value for society or for anybody. I have yet to hear of a single story where the abusive assertion of a patent has led to a product or a service that anyone considers valuable. Whatever these trolls gains, 
For businesses on the other side of the balance sheet, there's a real loss. All of that money that the defendants paid out in settlement dollars, do you think those defendants just absorbed it in their, in their, in their, in their corporate profits? No. These businesses often then can't invest in R&D. They can't create jobs. They have to lay people off. Sometimes they have to shut down. And then even companies that can afford these settlements and that, they, they, that pay these settlements, it, it, it would be completely not surprising to know that these companies pass the cost of these settlements on to their consumers. When companies pay these settlements, when they pay the toll of the troll, we pay too. We pay higher prices for less innovation. We absorb the costs associated with people who lose or never get to apply for jobs. You would think that with the damage trolls inflict on society, there would be some legal way to cramp their style. As it turns out, there is. Initially, I can tell you that the troll community, the first couple of trolls who sued us, they, they didn't believe, they couldn't believe that we were willing to take them to trial. We'll hear how Newegg and its chief legal officer, Lee Chang, found a way to use the trolls' own business plans against them, and how other companies can do the same in part two of Toll of the Troll, next week in episode 10. Between now and then, you might like to hear how trolls operate. Lee Cheng has an example, and I've put it in the show notes. And that brings to an end episode nine of Out of My Mind. We'll keep trolling for more essential, non-essential, and curiously essential information, though, and be back with a new show next Saturday at 8 a.m. Eastern. Earlier this week, I read an article about how radio stations are increasingly eliminating programming of interest to baby boomers. As a former disc jockey, I'm sorry to hear that. As the host of this show, I'm glad to know that more people will be looking for programs like this one. If you know of any of these radio orphans, please tell them they have a home here, and that for at least once a week, they can spend 17 minutes talking about things of interest to them and to you. I'm Jay Douglas. Out of My Mind is produced by Penny Summers and is a production of the Theater of Your Mind Incorporated, Hollywood, California.